everybody. Uh, happy New Year. Um, let me be the first to, to wish everyone a happy National Quinoa Day, by the way, which is on, on uh, <laughs> January 16th. So uh, welcome. My name is Jack Glassman. I'm chair of the committee for uh, probably, probably too long, uh, Historic Resources Committee. I'm also a historical architect with the National Park Service, our regional office. Work with a center of architects and engineers and conservators and landscape architects who support the parks throughout our region. So um, I'm reporting from a cozy little home office here in, the, in what's now called Charlestown, but uh, historically the uh, ancestral homeland of the Massachusetts people, uh, peninsula, that, peninsula that was, uh, um, uh, I just forgot what it was called. I'm blanking out here. Um, anyway, uh, let's let's start. Uh, I'd like to cover some uh, current events, so let's just uh, get right to it. I wanted to just note the passing of uh, Richard Rogers, the uh, Italian slash British British architect, Pritzker Prize winner, uh, shown here in front of. Uh, the Pompidou Center, the very controversial, well, certainly when it was first uh, first uh, completed uh, in Paris, and uh, and the Lloyds of London here, uh, shown on the lower left, and uh, the uh, World Trade Center, three World Trade Center uh, tower, in more in more recent years, I think. So, um, he, uh, as this uh, Globe obituary mentioned, he. Uh, Mr. Rogers turned architecture not just inside out, but also on its head. Um, unique, uh, the Pritzker Prize uh, honor the jury cited uh, his quote, unique interpretation of the modern movement's fascination with the building as machine, which certainly I think, um, I think uh, comes through uh, with these, uh, these images. But he also, he also really saw the Pompidou Center as a, as a place for a, a place for all people, as he, as he put it. So, um, by the way, if anyone uh, wants to, uh, uh, you know, sort of pipe in while I'm doing the, the sort of a summary of certain events uh, for, to correct me or clarify, provide if you know, provide any backstory that you might know, then please uh, feel free. It's not doesn't have to be just me talking, <laughs> talking head here. Um, in Brookline, the um, and then some of you have certainly followed the preservation, the sort of saga, uh, this H.H. H. Richardson's, well, a number of houses, uh, but uh, sort of focusing uh, on uh, the uh, uh, home, Richard H.H. H. Richardson's home when he lived in Brookline at 25 Cottage Street. The picture in the upper left shows that it was uh, the Perkins house uh, built by, around or by 1804, 1805. Uh, and it may have actually then been a sort of a drastic rehab of an earlier house, uh, later become Super and then Richardson. And within the house, uh, you see he had his uh, studio, which is pictured, which uh, studio and slash bedroom is pictured in the lower lower left. So um, I'm sure some of you have followed the kind of the, uh, well, the successful uh, creation of a Richardson Olmstead uh, local historic district. There were some battles there, but involving uh, uh, three adjacent properties, the mid-century modern and a couple of other houses, including the Perkins Hooper Richardson uh, that was created. It, it envelops and kind of includes, includes the Olmsted National Historic uh, Site. Um, the, uh, the restrictions cover just the exterior. So this site is, uh, it's going to be a housing project. Uh, it'll be a housing development, and the developer, the accounts are that the developer plans to gut the interior. So uh, Dennis Dewitt had sent out a um, just a uh, a plea, really. To you know, it just seems like some uh, museum, some institution, someone that might be interested. <laughs> I mean, uh, to you know, it's the interior of the bedroom studio is sort of yours for the taking. So he was hoping that someone would save it and remove it from the house before it all, all gets kind of gutted. It. it includes cork flooring, cork uh, 
for tanking on the wall. Uh, you can see that, that kind of interesting perforated ceiling. And there was also a hook where actually it was above his bed because of his weight. It was actually a, like a block and tackle that was used to facilitate his getting him out of bed. So very significant space. Um, let's see what happens. So, uh, just saw uh, there's purported uh, Couple of papers, including the Globe, uh, just about the, the the fact that the state having issued an RFP for redeveloping redeveloping the the Charles F. Hurley Building, the government center, and uh, including also some other parts of the site, the uh, area now used for parking uh, along Merrimack Street. Uh, so they did get four, I guess four four proposals, uh, and typically there's some leak, uh, you know, there's some press release or some description you know, in these kind of cases, what, what the developers kind of competing visions are and proposals, but apparently that's not happened yet. So everyone's sort of waiting, people are waiting to, to, to see. You know, it certainly uh, has been another preservation saga where the state seemed to want to demolish the whole thing originally, kind of conceded that um, with a great pushback and outpouring of support for preserving the, as much of the building as possible. Uh, so they modified the RFP. So four bids uh, for long-term lease uh, were submitted. Each one met the state's request to accommodate up to 350,000 square feet of government office. Um, but uh, as far as the additional development, you know, whether it's labs or retail or office, uh, still, uh, still to be determined. So stay tuned for, for that one. Uh, out uh, in West Newton, uh, the uh, armory uh, will be redeveloped. So that's more you know, I think a good news story that uh, it's going to be preserved. It's, it's going to be part of a um, 43 unit, uh, 43 rental units of affordable housing for families. Uh, and um, it will preserve the castle like uh, building. Uh, so the uh, field, uh, field house behind the shed will be. Will be demolished, as you can see, but uh, the uh, castle-like building is slated to become a community room and management offices and gallery space, according to the proposal. On the bay, parking on site and solar array on the roof. So, uh, really great, sort of inspiring story uh, about uh, a photographer, uh, former newsman, or maybe still newsman. I don't know. Uh, David Zapodka, who has undertaken this, uh, this uh, ambitious effort. Uh, and here you can see a little picture of him in front of the RV that was donated to the, to the effort by the um, Rhode Island uh, Lighthouse, uh, or the United States Lighthouse Society, excuse me. Um, so his goal is to, to photograph all of the 800, um, it started smaller, state, you know, in state by state. But now all of the active uh, 800 lighthouses around the country and to photograph them. And the catch is, it's, he wants to photograph them at night because that is, of course, when they are, when they're working, when they're doing their thing. Uh, and you can here's a couple example of some of this uh, beautiful work. Uh, as you can imagine, the technical challenges because uh, some of these. Uh, sites, don't have a whole lot of land around them. And he, he uh, had a, a, a 20 foot high iron <laughs> tripod made so that he could uh, anchor a boat and then uh, get these long exposures. But the other thing is uh, they're possible thanks to digital, the digital camera technology where they don't have to be, you know, minutes and minutes of the way the old uh, analog photography used to be where the stars would then start because of the rotation and you know, start to get these blurry stars. So he's figured out a way to thread the needle. So anyway, cool, cool story. Uh, uh, and he has, you can see he's released a couple of coffee table books as well for his work. Back a little closer to home, uh, saw the uh, work is ongoing at the maintenance shops to overhaul the historic, um, incredible little uh, Mattapan Ashmont of uh, uh, trolleys. Uh, you can see in the background, it's uh, going way, it makes its way through Dorchester, Milton, Mattapan. 
1940s era. So it's been an interesting slog, I guess, you know, getting replacement parts and upgrading electrical and, and so on. But I'm um, so happy that they're they're doing this, preserving this, this still, you know, they're, they're still still running, but they have a number of uh, vehicles that are being worked on. Um, the news story was that it's been plagued by delays. And, well, the reasons you could imagine. <laughs> but uh, it's a 2.6 mile track, by the way, that connects the red line and 11 bus lines at Ashmont Station and nine bus lines. Um, Lines of Manapan. So I, I highly remember. recommend Jack. I highly recommend Jack, that. It's a field that. trip to anybody who hasn't been there because you go all the way down to the end of the red line to the south end and then end of it. And then you get on one of these things, and then it's a beautiful walk if you get out at the lower mills. You can walk along the river and there's this beautiful bridge. It's a wonderful bird walk in the spring or any time by the river. Yeah. And yeah, you get there by this cool train. It's just kind of fun. And then you see it chugging along, surprisingly, yeah. next to the river. It's a really fun excursion. Yeah. I recommend it. Thanks, David. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I I remember going once a long time ago, right, riding along it. And you just don't feel like you're, you're not in the city, as you can imagine. It's, it's truly, you know, urban miles. I totally um, agree, David, too. I, I run, I live in that neighborhood, and I run along the the trail and I, I wave to them every time and they do the toot toot <laughs> oh, really? and um, yeah I guess somebody told me too is a Ripley's believe it or not is it the only transit or trolley line that goes through a cemetery so <laughs> really <laughs> yeah <laughs> hmm. I'll have to fact check that one hmm. thanks Anita yeah um what else was I going to say about that? Yeah. Oh, it's going to, yeah. That's also great. That trail is a bike path as well. It's really worth a visit. Okay. This one got me. I'm going to try to not just rant too much, but uh, just have came across in the Atlantic. Uh, M. Nolan Gray, who's uh, identified as a professional city planner and housing researcher, wrote this article about. Uh, uh, that includes, uh, well, the, the title and uh, excerpt from uh, his quotes, stop fetishizing old homes. Whatever your aesthetic preferences, new construction is better on nearly every conceivable measure. And um, he, uh, so he, he's a housing researcher at UCLA and author of a book called Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It. Um, so he's describing it. Uh, it, there's a, a lot of, uh, as a researcher, but it's got all these sort of anecdotal experiences, including the apartment building where he lives and comparing it to when uh, he lived somewhere else that was quieter and old houses that don't have insulated glass, so there's noise problem. And um, it was just starting to get to me, I guess. So I just wanted to share, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if it's something that you're interested in or passionate about and want to read it and then send a letter to him, be my guest. But here he, you know, he talks about uh, a, um, in the Bay Area a housing, a four bedroom ranch from the 1960s and how, uh, how much it sold for, uh, you know, according to Redfin and so on. But he goes, this extreme case highlights a housing market in crisis. Americans are paying ever more exorbitant prices for old housing that is at best subpar and at worst unsafe. Um, and it compares uh, houses to uh, you know, the car market in Cuba, where a stagnant supply of junkers is being forced into service long after the intended lifespan. So it makes certain references to, you know, well, yes, environmentally, I should say that, but then he jumps to his, <laughs> back to his, his arguments, like here in housing circles. One, here is a lot of self-righteous discussion about the need for more preservation. And many American homes doubt this served deserve to stick around, but the truth is that we fetishize old homes. And uh, yeah, moving a little further um, across the country, especially along the coast, barriers to construction mean that housing production has plummeted. That's what we now face in the national demand supply gap of 6.8 million homes. 
So um, and he cites the Association of Realtors, National Association, saying we would to break even over the next 10 years, we'd have to build at least 700,000 new homes. In the meantime, we're stuck with a lot of old housing that, to put it bluntly, just kind of sucks. The stately Victorian manor and the Berkshires is one thing, but if you live in a Boston triple-decker, a kit-built San Jose bungalow or a Chicago Greystone, your home is the cheap housing of generations past. So, uh, all right. Um, I will wrap up with just one other quote where he then says, even when old housing is not killing its occupants, much of it is exclusionary by design. He references the ADA and, and standard elements such as ramps and elevators and all that are not, uh, not found in many older buildings. All right. Um, got my blood, my, uh, got me <laughs> going when I read that one. Uh, another, uh, uh, interesting story you got from Spain, a kind of an update, and thanks Eileen for sending this along from the New York Times, um, entitled uh, Spanish Mystery is a masked restorer to blame for a church's botched repair. Uh, some of you might, might have seen in the news, there was a, a fresco, I guess it was a fresco or painting, um, that uh, a woman had, uh, you know, sort of, uh, with all the best intentions done, sort of homemade, or this sort of do-it-yourself kind of uh, art restorations that have been going around. And I guess Spain has, has got maybe the lion's share of these sort of things. And then similarly with, uh, with buildings. So upper right showing uh, just some cement thrown into a mortar. Uh, you know, part of my, you know, looking at that and I thought, well, okay, <laughs> dog bites man or something. It's like, yeah, we're, we see plenty of those. Uh, in the United States too, at small and large scales, but uh, the uh, it did uh, it, it did make the news just because of uh, I think a number just because of the sort of surprise element in this particular case. Um, I, I didn't write. I wrote that Castro Nuno in Spain is actually the place where that church is, but it's actually a it's Church of Santa Maria del Castillo, I think. But anyway, just showing. Uh, the uh, homemade kind of repairs and how uh, the problem is there, there are too many, you know, in a place where there are, are too many historic <laughs> uh, resources and not enough uh, talent or money to, to do the repairs. On a brighter note, uh, <laughs> kind of literally uh, just read a review um, of, a, of a book by uh, uh, two scholars, Matthew. Matthew Gabriel and uh, David Perry. It's called The Bright Ages, A New History of Medieval Europe. And uh, it really takes a, a whole sort of different look at um, those thousand years or so that we, that the conventional wisdom and, and all is that it was a, you know, just a great shadow loomed over Europe and you know, blocking the sun of learning and erudition, uh, stifling thought and action. I mean, what we call the dark ages. And they argue that it really is incorrect and that there was really a blossoming of uh, you know, faith and, uh, and architecturally here with a kind of example, a metaphor. There are a lot of metaphors of light here uh, that uh, I guess in the, in the book and then the, uh, the reviewer, uh, the Globe reviewer had some, had some fun with it as well about uh, uh, their argument being incandescent. Uh, that the Bright Ages contain the beauty and light of stained glass and the high ceilings of the cathedral and the golden relics of the church, acts of charity and devotion by people of great faith. Um, it sounds like a sounds like a really fascinating book and sort of a new take on, um, as I said, what used to be called the Dark Ages. Uh, other good news. Uh, this was really interesting. Uh, in uh, in uh, Saskatchewan, uh, part of the uh, Wapetan uh, Dakota Nation. It's all part of this, this great territory. So we're subject to the so-called Treaty Six, where you know, uh, indigenous people moved to reservations. We know that story. But there is uh, there's this heritage park, uh, and the uh, the uh, museum and the interpretive site all, you know, all sort of focused on the importance of bison. To the, to the native peoples. Uh, and it was just 
in 2019, or really, just they finally, after many years, they reintroduced bison, uh, the plains bison to the ancestral lands. Uh, and the elders of uh, the uh, Dakota Nation had long prophecy, prophesied that the return of the plains to these lands would pretend a welcome turn of events for Canada's First Nation peoples. So uh, little, little did everyone know that uh, only months after the bison were reintroduced, the herd's hooves uncovered four petroglyphs for rock carvings and an accompanying stone tool used to create, create the ancient artwork. And so what these uh, pictures are showing is this giant boulder and then a uh, close up, this kind of grid that uh, uh, the one on the left is called a rib stone. And apparently the grid was supposed to be showing actually representing the ribs of the bison that were, uh, that they were, were hunted and relied, relied upon. So um, the uh, you know, site that was, uh, so these were dated between 300 and 1800 years ago, uh, probably a thousand years old, representing the first petroglyphs discovered at that site. So anyway, so thanks to the thanks to the bison who who would sort of uh, dust themselves off or with their hooves and they actually uncovering these uh, these petroglyphs on that site. Um, moving to uh, cutting edge technology. Uh, there's a Boston startup called Clio Robotics. Uh, they've developed a uh, a different kind of uh, drone that's uh, designed to go into uh, possibly hazardous spaces, but definitely confined indoor spaces. As you can see, um, it uh, uses a sort of a ducted fan as opposed to the quad copter sort of thing that we've all seen. So this, uh, and it's a carbon fiber, I think, you know, sort of reinforced plastic. So the idea is this could go through, through ducts and in sewer lines and hovering above muck and so on. Uh, where it would be unsafe or you know, really un confined space, unpleasant for a human to go. Uh, and because it doesn't have the propellers, so if it you know, bumps into the side of something, it doesn't crash. Um, um, so uh, it just occurred to me, you know, and it's got a high definition camera system and 3D LiDAR laser rangefinder so it can deliver images and video. Um, so, uh, you guys think that uh, would be a good, I should reach out and ask if they'd like to give a presentation because it certainly seems to me that this has uh, great applicability for uh, historic sites and structures, uh, it, you know, areas that uh, where it just would be difficult or dangerous to go. Um, that is sort of what I had. I forgot to include uh, a couple of articles that I had saved um, that uh, in the interest of time, won't spend too much time on it, but there was there was one uh, about the uh, plans for modern interior at Notre Dame Cathedral, which is all, I guess, very, very preliminary, but uh, it's plans have incited the ire of traditionalists. Somebody talking, and you could mute, that would be great. Um, anyway, um, so maybe that's me getting some feedback. If it is, I apologize. But so the uh, Notre Dame, I guess, uh, sort of uh, on both sides of the pond, there's been in indignation with how the interior might look and uh, some criticism from kind of some of the conservative media uh, thinking that it's uh, going to become a woke theme park you know, by including uh, our politically correct Disneyland, by uh, you know, including multi-language interpretation and so on. Then the final uh, final thing that uh, people want to uh, read more from uh, Aaron Betsky, the critic uh, and educator, uh, wrote in Architect Magazine uh, uh, a piece called "Teaching Architecture Through a Critical Race Theory Lens in Virginia." So he's he's going to speaking with his uh, uh, mentioning including as part of his his course work. Um, Talking about the uh, uh, how architecture really uh, plays plays into the uh, uh, into that story. Uh, here's a quote: "What? Do, why does all this? What does all this have to do with architecture? Quite a lot." As one of the chapters in 1619 makes clear, the oppression of black communities 
has been built into American design and zoning for almost as long as the country existed. So he plans to uh, kind of forge ahead, uh, even though the new governor, in Virginia, has pledged to, uh, to eliminate all uh, sort of reference to uh, the critical race theory and so on, at least in the uh, K through 12. So, um, okay, ready to uh, move on, move into our uh, future presentation. If I, uh, Stop my share. All right. Um, Christian Simonelli is the executive director of the Boston Groundwater Trust. Uh, he holds a degree in environmental engineering from Wentworth Institute of Technology. Uh, he was hired by the trust in 1999 as a field engineer. And so uh, here's a case where the, the CEO uh, unusual case where he, I think, and correct me uh, when you're speaking, has, has, has seen and inspected every well located in the trust observation well network. Uh, personally, has done that from uh, working uh, uh, as a field engineer and then a uh, technical and research coordinator. Uh, and um, he was appointed executive director in 2014 and runs the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. Well, Christian, thanks so much for speaking to us. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And yes, that's correct. Sad but true. I have uh, read every single observation well in the well network more than I care to remember. So um, we have young field engineers now that do that. But um, from time to time, I still go out to those spots and um, also supervise the installation of new wells. So um, thank you for having me. I'm, it seems like we got a pretty good crowd here this morning, and I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into it and share my screen. So really what I'm going to talk about today um, is really who we are, what we do, and, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, why it's important. Um, so as Jack mentioned, this is pretty much my, my background. So I have been with the trust since 1999. And I was hired as a field engineer initially to go out and to uh, find existing observation wells that were in the public way. And that those wells that were installed by various projects over the years. And that really formed sort of the base of our observation well network, which was around 150 wells. And then in, in 2002, um, you know, we received uh, uh, money from the environmental bond bill. Uh, in the amount of $1.6 billion. And that was really the financial backbone of our uh, ability to go out and expand the observation wall network to where it is today, where we have around 800 wells. And, um, you know, my day-to-day -day duties, uh, you know, ultimately first and foremost include uh, collecting this data, analyzing it, and, and really just reviewing it uh, and looking for areas where groundwater is depleted and where we could have an issue. Um, also promote methods of recharge, and I'll get into that, and really just doing this, um, you know, uh, speaking to groups, telling them, you know, what we do, uh, why we do it, and really the, the ultimately the importance of it. So uh, who we are, so we were established by the city council in 1986 for the sole purpose of monitoring the groundwater levels in areas of the city where building foundations, wood piling supportive foundations are threatened by low groundwater levels. Our nine trustees are appointed by the mayor. So we have uh, trustees from all really the affected neighborhoods of the city. So the South End, the Back Bay, Chinatown. Um, we're working actually on expanding it to, to include East Boston, but I'll, I'll show you all the areas really our monitoring area and our areas of interest. Our funding primarily comes from the city. So we're not a city agency. We're set up as a, as a quasi city state entity where we are a 501c3. And we're really contracted by the city's environment department to do the work. And that's really where the bulk of our operating funds come from. So what do we do? So again, we install and, and monitor really the network of wells to identify areas where groundwater levels may not be optimum and above the tops of the wood pilings. Um, each time we go out and we read, we read wells. So we read the whole well network about 60 times per year. And then we put together a report and I'm going to show you what, what that looks like ultimately and where it highlights our areas of, of interest. We also work through the BPDA and the state environmental review process to minimize the likelihood that any new building, any new project will not have a negative impact on the groundwater table. And I'm going to talk about that. Testify at the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'll, I'll tell you about that and why that's important. 
Um, and ultimately, we investigate methods to promote groundwater recharge and, and why that's important. You know, we're in an urban environment where everything is paved. So the ability for the groundwater table to be replenished uh, is very low um, due to being in an urban environment. So how do we promote green infrastructure to help sort of get it back and keep that groundwater table recharged? So to understand us is really to, to understand how the city was made and, and really ultimately what the original Boston looked like. And you can see this map, you know, the solid areas here in the white were really original land. And then all the areas that are, that are, that are shaded and that are hatched in the black are, are for areas that were filled in and areas that were made. And so if we have buildings in, the, in those areas that were constructed from the mid 1800s to the early 1900s, um, and they're heavy buildings, they're brick buildings, there's a good chance they're on, you know, wood piles. And as we go through, so this is sort of the western part of the city and East Boston up here, and then you can see East Boston too is also a, a pretty significant amount of fill. East Boston actually has the most amount of fill, uh, neighborhood has the most fun amount of fill in the city, which is primarily due obviously to the, uh, you know, building and creation of the airport, but um, East Boston really sort of uh, isn't thought about a whole lot as an area that has buildings that have wood pilings, but in fact, it has many. So what did the city look like prior to filling? You know, this is a view actually from the State House in 1858. And here's Beacon Street, here's Arlington Street, and here it is right here. Hence the term and the name Back Bay. This is, it was just that, it was a bay, it was nothing more than a swamp. Uh, due to public health issues at the time, the area was filled in. Um, this area had really become sort of a cesspool and become a, a health hazard. And so over the period of about 30 years, just to fill Back Bay in the Fenway, uh, it took about six days a week, 24 hours a day uh, with trains, just constantly coming in with fill. Uh, the primarily the amount of fill brought, it was brought in from the Needham Hills. And you can see here sort of the train tracks and the trains coming along and just dumping the fill in. Um, early creation of Back Bay, you started to see the uh, establishment of the Commonwealth Avenue Mall here with the trees, early, early Beacon Street row houses. And this building here, these houses and coupled with this building here are actually still here today. This is the restoration hardware. Just to give you an idea where everything is, this is Berkeley Street running along here, and you have Newbury Street right here. So really, how the city was made. Um, I love this image. I think it's from an, a balloon, a hot air balloon. I've never been able to find the source of <laughs> of, of the image, um, you know, sort of where it was taken from. But it, 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 it that's sort of what I've surmised and what others have surmised over the years. And eventually, over here, you get the Red Sox. This is ultimately where Fenway Park would be in the Fenway at some point. So today, we have a city that you know, is primarily, you know, built on fill. Um, the original land is indicated here in the red. So our monitoring area pretty much extends um, really on this side of downtown and then a little bit of the outskirts along um, Four Point Channel, Bullfinch, North End, um, down in here. A lot of the buildings in South Boston are on are, are wood frame buildings and they're newer buildings and they're on concrete. So there isn't really anything down there that's on wood. So it's really primarily the Back Bay, the South End, the Fenway, um, huge chunk of the South End, obviously, uh, the Chinatown Leather District, and then also portions of East Boston. And really to understand sort of how this issue sort of was revived, you have to look back at the history of the city and, and what happened. And really after World War II, this, the city of the, popul the population of the city really plummeted. People left. There was really a mass exodus to the suburbs and you could see the population numbers here from 1950 to 1980 and what happened. And um, believe it or not, in the 1970s, you could actually rent a Back Bay apartment for $240 a month. Um, as most of you probably know, you can't park in the Back Bay for $240 a month, now, never mind live there. Um, so it's really interesting to see how the city evolved and how the city transformed. And we really are now a center for uh, education, medicine, and finance. And you get people that have really started to come back and the city really, the population really exploded in the mid eighties to early nineties and continues today. Um, so why we were established, if you picked up a paper in the 1980s, you would have uh, seen articles uh, with headlines like this. What's going on? Why are these buildings settling? Um, and the very reason that that was, was that there was no groundwater trust. There was nobody out there actively monitoring groundwater. There was no network of observation well. So these buildings were just allowed to settle. And when you get to the point where a building settles and you start to see signs of distress and, uh, you know, cracks above windows and below doors, at that point, it's too late. Um, you know, at that point, the pilings are rotted and then you need to be repaired. 
So the people on Beacon Hill went to the city and said, what are you doing? Uh, the city said nothing. And they said, well, you need to do something. And ultimately, that's how we were established in 1986. So what's at risk? You know, I, I like to show people this slide because it gives them an idea financially, you know, what we're looking at and what we're talking about. So all the areas here that are highlighted are areas where we have observation wells and buildings that are supported on wood piles. And you'll notice the property tax levy and how that's increased really over the past six fiscal years. And you can see the amount of real estate ultimately that, that generates really the net property tax levy and is really responsible for the city's budgeted revenues, about 73% here in FY21. So there's a huge portion of the city's uh, you know, financial really backbone or in these areas and that are housed on buildings that are supported on wood piles. And if you take a typical block, just in an area, filled land area of the city, and you look at the assessed value of these buildings. And I like to tell people that if, if there was no groundwater trust, uh, like there was in the 1980s, and groundwater levels were allowed to be, uh, you know, depleted and nobody was monitoring levels, this is what could be at risk. You know, you could be looking at all these buildings that are supported on wood piles and ultimately needed to be repaired. You would have a cost of anywhere from 12 to $20 million or more to repair all these buildings. Now multiply that by all the blocks in these areas of the cities if we had groundwater levels that were depressed and you, you're talking about a, a significant catastrophic really financial burden of repairs. This is the sole responsibility of the building owner. There's no insurance for this. There are no city programs for it. The cost to underpin a building can be anywhere from 250. I've seen it as much as $3 million, depending on the size of the building. It's a very labor intensive, very uh, expensive process. So I get this asked a lot, why would? Um, at the time that these buildings were constructed, it was simply the method at the time. And, and when you look at uh, heavy buildings that are built on suitable on unsuitable land, uh, Trinity Church in Copley Square, for example, has over 4,500 wood piles to support its its you know its building. Um, the Santa Maria della Salute Basilica in Venice, this was built in the in the 1600s, actually rests on over one million wood piles and still stands today. Um, so just to give you an idea of, of, of you know, the, the structures that we have, not only in the city, but abroad, um, buildings that are supporting the wood piles is, is, is pretty significant and pretty impressive. And when we look at a building, you know, we take a typical row house. So this is an ideal condition. You have these wood piles that support a building and, and all a wood pile is, is an inverted tree trunk driven upside down into the ground, but its branches removed. And it could typically be eight to 10 inches in diameter. And depending on where you are in the city and depending on how far they had to go down to bearing stratum, a wood pile can be anywhere from 15 feet to 25 or 35 feet in length. And what we look for is the ideal condition of the water table, which is indicated by this upside down triangle above the tops of the wood piles. The water table preserves the wood piles. The water above the wood piles keeps the piles intact, keeps the building foundation intact. An example here are buildings that are actually under the old South Church at the corner of Dartmouth Street and Boylston in the Back Bay. This was for a test pit that was done some years ago. And you can see these wood piles here intact with the granite block that rests on top of, of, of them to ultimately form the foundation in good shape. You know, these buildings, these piles, for example, are over 300 years old. Uh, another building here, this was actually a row house uh, that was in the Fenway. Uh, again, uh, for the purposes of inspecting, the water table was temporarily lowered, and you can see the pile here. Again, this building is over 100 years old, in good shape, intact with a granite block, no issue, building is fine, piles are fine. Here's where we run into the problem, where the groundwater table drops for whatever reason. It could be uh, a leaking sewer. It could be a drought, even for a very extended period of time, which we worry about with climate change, prolonged periods of drought. You know, we have these massive swings. Uh, where we have a lot of rain and that we don't have any rain. Um, it's, it's definitely an issue moving forward that we, that, you know, that we need to pay attention to. But in the case of a significant rapid drop, it's usually something that's caused by us. And by us, I mean, it's usually an infrastructure, a sewer, a tunnel, something that has, has been operating fine, but all of a sudden has sprung a leak. And once the groundwater table drops, it's our uh, job really to find out and work with the entities, why is, has it dropped? And we look at the infrastructure in the area, and I'm going to show you an example of that, of ultimately an investigation and a repair. So once the water table is dropped, the wood piles are now exposed to the environment. They're exposed to air, and decay begins. 
And decay is a very slow process, which is wonderful for us because it gives us time to find a, find a, you know, uh, a solution to the problem. Um, it could be anywhere from five years. It could be anywhere from 15 years. There's a number of factors that, that you know, uh, cause the pile to decay uh, at different rates and different speeds. So it's our job to bring this water table back up because when you bring the water table back up, the presence of oxygen is removed and ultimately the process of decay really slows to a crawl. It doesn't completely stop, but it, it, it's on a factor of you know millimeters per year um, to a point where uh, it would no longer become an issue once the groundwater table has been raised. And so what you get is this. Um, unlike the previous photos, you get a pile that basically if you picture taking an unsharpened pencil and putting it into a pencil sharpener, that's what you get. The pile completely decays to the point where this section here uh, rots. And what happens is that the support that uh, was holding up that granite block and really holding up the building, that support now is lost. And the rates of decay differ. You know, these are piles that, that, were, that were under underneath the same wall. Uh, these piles here are also underneath the same wall. And you have uh, different rates of decay piles decay at different times. And what you get is this, uh, you probably know this term, you get differential settlement. So instead of the, the building settle evenly, the building settles at all you know, different rates and you get stairways that become crooked. You get cracks and bulges in walls. You get brick that starts to pop out of the building. You know, These are obvious signs of the stress. These were the signs of the stress that were observed in Lower Beacon Hill. And the solution is to go in and dig a hole. You basically have to go under the building and tunnel by hand, and you have to uncover each one of these wood piles. You then have to take a chainsaw, and this is actually the, the third video on our homepage of our website, details this whole process. It's about a five minute video, the process of underpinning. And you have to go in basically with a chainsaw, cut off the rotted portion of the pile. And then you have to basically uh, put in a steel lally column to reestablish the connection between the pile and the granite block. But you have to do that for every pile. So if you had to underpin Trinity Church, which has 4,500 wood piles, it would take a little bit. Uh, a typical row house that has, you know, maybe 150 to 200 wood piles takes about 12 to 18 months, depending on what you have for access and how easily they can get in and out. You encase that whole thing in concrete, and then you move on to the next series of, of, of piles under the building. And you got to do about a pit a week. So if you get 150, 200 piles, and you're only doing six, seven, eight at a time, uh, it's a pretty labor intensive, long, expensive process. <clears throat> so to try to mitigate all this, we monitor the groundwater levels. So this is a typical observation well that we have. The majority of them are in the sidewalk, they're in the public way. Um, and uh, observation well is nothing more than a PVC pipe with the bottom 10 feet um, slotted, uh, ultimately for water to get into that observation well and that gives us uh, the ability to measure the observation well in uh, excuse me to measure the water table that's in the fill and it's the water table that's in the fill that's in that top layer is what's most directly impacts wood piles and typically our wells are 20 to 25 feet they don't go any deeper than that and they're in these areas of the city so when we come up to an observation well we open the cover we simply take a water level indicator and we take the depth to water that depth to water measurement tells us the water is 10 feet below the ground surface, 12 feet below the ground surface. And then we can directly correlate that with the information that we have on wood pile cutoff elevations uh, under all the buildings. And I'll get into that in a little bit. There's really not that much information, but we're, we're constantly you know, gaining knowledge of, of that. So I like to show people this because again, when I started, you know, we had 86 wells. And then I mentioned for about a year or two, we went out, we found almost double that in our well network went up to about 150. And then as you can see over the years, once we got the funding in 2002, we slowly started to expand the observation well network to where we are today. Um, we're constantly evaluating wells, replacing wells on an annual basis, going out every you know year or two years, replacing 10 to 15 wells, replacing older wells. We also get um, new observation wells from projects. So anytime there's a big building going up and it's in our area of interest, um, you know, the applicant for that building, the proponent will install observation walls in the public way for us and ultimately we'll get those and that that helps us fill in the gaps, which is great. Installing wells is never easy um, and I like to show people this, you know, we've really peppered the city in the areas of the filled land with our observation walls and we go out, we have to pre-mark these um, uh, for dig safe to come out and you can see 
the uh, the X with the uh, circle, uh, the white uh, X and the white circle around is where we wanted to put the well. But then, um, you know, utilities come out and mark our own and say, not so fast, not going to happen. Um, so we have to sort of find our, our new areas to fill in the gaps. Maybe we go across the street. Maybe we go a little bit further down the street, either way to get away from this stuff. And before we even put a shovel in the ground, we um, use this core bore and we core a 12 inch diameter hole that's in the sidewalk. And what that does is it removes the, the, the top portion of the concrete. And then we come in with a big, excavator, big vacuum excavator truck and we suck out the first six to eight feet of fill. Um, it's been my experience that I don't care what those lines say, painted lines say on the ground. Uh, there's something under there that, that, that you know, sometimes um, isn't on somebody's plans who came out with uh, their markers to paint the sidewalk and we have to shift and move it. So take extreme precaution when we put these in to avoid hitting anything, um, electrical, uh, you know, water, whatever it is, gas, uh, most notably, obviously. Um, and as part of replacing uh, wells, we also replace all their observation wells. So I like to show people this because this is actually a groundwater level report um, from the Works Progress Administration. And this is a well that was installed at the corner of the uh, Exeter and Boston Street, right in front of the Lenox Hotel. And it was installed in 1937. And when we opened the cover to the well, the well was plugged. So we decided to replace it. And ultimately, these sheets are valuable because at the time, it can tell us what the groundwater elevation was um, and sort of what the soil conditions were and what to expect, you know, for, for, for drilling. And in this case here, they uh, noted extremely heavy driving at the bottom of the borehole. And that proved out to be true because it was a very thick layer of, uh, uh, of, of gravel before we actually got to the bottom of the bay, which is the organic silt. And that's ultimately where we set the bottom of the observation wells into the original bottom of the bay before it was filled in. So it's very valuable, um, you know, to have these reports here and it really helps us and gives us an idea on what we're in for. So today, this is our monitoring area. As, as, I, as, I, as I showed you before, you know, all these areas that are highlighted are areas that we have wells and we have buildings that are supported on wood piles. And on our website, our monitoring well data tab, each one of these blue dots is a monitoring point. So each one of these blue dots is an observation well. And when you click on a particular dot, it'll give you the lifetime readings of the wells um, for every reading that's ever been taken for each well. And I often, often uh, get asked, and I actually just recently found out about this the past couple of months, um, the only other area in the world that has anywhere even close to the monitoring network that we have is in Amsterdam. They have about 180,000 buildings that are supported with piles. Just to give you an idea, we have, you know, close to 9,000 buildings that are supported with piles. So they have many more buildings. And as a result, they have many more observation wells. And it was interesting speaking with them because their monitoring efforts are very similar to ours. Um, they have about 2,500 wells, which is, you know, almost triple what we have. But they read them about 60 times per year. And again, the, the sole purpose of identifying um, areas that are low and, and potentially buildings that may be at risk. So when you go on our website, um, you know, you want to look at uh, uh, observation well data and you want to look at the building data that we have. And that's all in Boston city based data, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. So Boston city based data, really the relationship 5.65 feet above, uh, you know, mean low tide. And, and we're concerned with that elevation because again, that's where the majority of the tops of the wood piles reside. They reside around an elevation five to six. There are some buildings that have higher cutoff elevations. There are some buildings that have lower cutoff elevations. So when you look at our observation well data, typically you would love to see all of the wells have this elevation anywhere from six to seven, because that means if the wood piles are cut off at elevation five and you have water at six to seven, that means the water is one to two feet above the tops of the pilings. There are some cases in areas of the city where the buildings have higher power cutoff elevations, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit to explain why. Um, and as a result, the water table is higher, thankfully. Um, but we really have to keep an eye on on that, and we have to manage. You know, it's very difficult to manage and mitigate areas where we have higher power cutoff elevations because we need higher water table elevations. And when we complete the uh, set of readings, we create this color-coded map. It's very difficult to see in this scale, um, and I'm gonna show you another scale in a little bit, but what this does is it color codes and it plots all of our wells um, in a color coding system. Ideally, we would love the majority of the wells to be green and above, okay? But you can see we have some number of wells that are in the four to five range. So if we have wells that are in this range, that means the lower the groundwater elevation, the more the wood pile is exposed. 
And this gives you an idea, a close up of really what it looks like. So this is East Boston, it's on a much smaller scale, but you can see the majority of the wells are in the greens and the blues that we like to see. Again, that means a factor of safety waters above the tops of the piling is more. But our areas of concern here are pretty narrow and they're pretty small. You can see some pile, some wells that we have here are low. And we have identified the culprit of, of it's particularly at this intersection, it's actually being repaired as we speak. Hopefully the groundwater tables uh, here will recover once they make that repair. But the whole point of monitoring is to find these spots and then work on a solution to make sure that you know, they recover and ultimately are brought back up. So why do we have so many wells? You know, why do we basically have a well in every corner and then mid block? There is a variability to the cutoff elevations under these buildings. All of these buildings were constructed at different times. They, they, you know, they weren't constructed all of uh, uh, Beacon Street or all of Kilmonic Street in the Fenway. They weren't all built at the same time. There were lots, lots were filled in. And then over time, you had different builders come in warranting different higher, different pile cutoff elevations. You know, um, the building on the left had a higher power cutoff elevation at the time because maybe at the time in the late 1800s, the water table was at eight. And the uh, builder, then the engineer thought, okay, seven's fine. It gives me a factor of safety of one. Well, fast forward, maybe five, six years later, well, the water tables, you know, it's about six. So the power should be cut off at elevation five. And you actually get to look at the variability of this. And this was actually one of the more striking things to me when I was doing my research and trying to find information about wood piles. It specifically talks about the grades that they can be cut off. And I saw a grade five and I said, okay, great. And then I read this sentence and it talks about the commissioner having a discretion um, to warrant and approve anything not exceeding grade nine. So that's a four foot variability that, you, that you're playing with there. Um, and when you look at our observation wall data, you can see that the water table doesn't move a whole lot between readings, you know, it moves a couple of inches here and there. Well, we have a high, very high uh, variability uh, of, of high, high cutoffs. Thankfully, it, it, based on our research, it seems to sort of be confined to certain areas and it's not a widespread issue, but there are earlier buildings that have higher power cutoff elevations. And as, again, as I was doing my research and you know, I, I was looking through the, uh, all the journals and the reports, I came across this narrative, which I thought was really interesting. You know, it talks about the common practice was to cut off the wood piles at the average tide level, grade five. And the groundwater level of the back bay at the time in the 19th century was around elevation eight. And so what we talk about is we look at, at, at how did the city evolve? How did we get here? Well, we paved over everything. We put in sewers and drains and tunnels and deep basements. So not only did we take away the natural recharge at the time, then we started to put all this stuff and just evolve in a city that potentially at some point, like everything else over time will break and that can cause the groundwater table to withdraw. So the engineers had a real push pull about what the cutoff elevation should be. Some engineers felt that elevation five was too low. Others said, oh, you can cut them off at eight. That's perfectly fine. The water tables at eight, you can cut them off at eight. Wisely, um, you know, most people disagreed with that engineer and said, no, it should really be more elevation five or six is what they should be cut, out, cut off at. And it talks about, again, decreased infiltration of the surface water, floor drains. By 1931, um, the BPL, the central branch in Copley Square had water wood piles. And they actually had to repair their building at a cost of around $250,000, which today would be in the millions of dollars. And ultimately the committee met at that time and they said, you know what, nothing actually should be cut off higher than elevation three, just in the back bay based on these findings. Problem was by 1931, everything that was gonna be built on wood was built <laughs> and they started to use concrete and steel. So um, this is ultimately what we're dealing with. And when we went through the original building permits, we went through all the building jackets and on inspectional services, at inspectional services, went through all the building inspector reports at the Boston Public Library and put that data on our website. And what we had hoped to find during that search process were original building permits. And these were the original building permits for a particular building would say that it's on piles, the length of the piles, how many rows, and more importantly, what their cutoff grade was. And so what we did was we compiled these color-coded elevation maps to show what buildings were uh, at risk potentially. And then we overlaid that where our observation well data, we said, okay, these are the areas that we need to focus on. 
So this map shows Beacon Hill, and this is all the foundation we have for uh, the, the flat of the hill. And you can see a bunch of red addresses. So I mentioned early on that we were established in 1986 because of the groundwater issue. Each one of these red addresses are buildings that have been repaired. Now, this was the, this was the data that we uh, could only find online for the original building permits. Unfortunately, the, 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 the records aren't that complete, um, but it's been assumed that, you know, 85 to 90 percent of the buildings in this area have been underpinned. So there's a lot more red addresses here that we have indicated. But just to give you an idea of how many buildings um, were affected, Brimmer Street was really ground zero for the issue. You can see almost every building on Brimmer Street had to be repaired um, and had to be underpinned. And the Church of the Advent here, right at the corner of Mount Vernon and Brimmer also had, a, had issues with piles. And they actually have an old active uh, well monitoring system for their building as well to keep an eye on. So as we went through all these building permits, this is what we compiled. You know, we, we searched again, roughly about 8,300 buildings. Again, there's close to 9,000 buildings. So this is a really a working document. And thankfully what we had found, we had found the majority of the information to be in the four to five range. So the power cutoffs were in the four to five range, but you can see the number of buildings versus the number of buildings with data was only about 20%. Um, so, our, our theory has always been, if we extrapolate that data that we have, there's far more buildings that are in the four to five range. The buildings that had higher power cutoff elevations in the five to six and the six to seven and the seven plus, thankfully are in areas where we have high water elevations. You know, these areas that are in the six and the sevens, we have water elevations at seven and eight. And even in this area where we have seven, we have elevations that are at eight and nine, which is great. Um, don't know if it was always that that was always the case because our, our data only goes back to 1999 and there is a huge gap between those WPA wells in the late 30s uh, and then our data and the you know uh, beginning really beginning of the of the millennium really in 2000. So um, as we move forward with proponents and we move forward with people applying to do work, this is what we're looking at and this is what we're looking to get and people have been very willing to share their information with us so if somebody comes in to substantially rehabilitate a building and they take a look at the foundation we ask them to share that report with us and they have we're also in the process right now of working with the inspectional services department to have a plan in place when somebody comes in to apply to do that work that we get flagged and ultimately we be able to start the dialogue again to add to our information so how do we raise and maintain the water levels? We have to fix the stuff that leaks, okay? The sewers, the tunnels, anything new that comes in, any proponent that's gonna come in and put a new building with deep foundations, three levels of underground parking, all that needs to be waterproofed and watertight. No sump pumps, no under drains. And the Groundwater Conservation Overlay District, known as the GCOD, ultimately what was established, I'm gonna review that with you very quickly. Um, and that is really uh, the, the, the hook uh, of the GCOD is to make sure that anything new that comes in is only going to have a positive impact on the water table, promoting green infrastructure, talk about recharge systems, pervious pavers, porous pavement is also essential, again, to get that water back in the ground. Just to give you an idea, I love this screenshot of sort of what we're up against here, all the infrastructure that's underneath the city. You can see just the messy utilities and sewers and drains and tunnels and all the stuff that we have, particularly water and sewer. Um, you know, this image is courtesy of them. If any of this stuff is below the groundwater table and it leaks, it's going to, the groundwater is going to go there. It's going to go into a manhole. It's going to go into a sewer pipe. It's going to go into a lateral. Such was the case in the summer of 2016 in the back bay. Um, the color-coded maps here that you can see, we had a number of observation wells um, below the ideal, below the green and below the elevation five. If you remember, that summer was the driest summer we ever had. We had just over three inches of rain in about four months. When it rained in the fall, the water levels came back in the majority of the wells, except for this, these hot spots here. And we said, gee, you know, why uh, has the groundwater table not recovered? The Boston Water and Sewer Commission went out and they took a look at the corner of Beacon and Fairfield Street. And they found a sewer and manholes that had just groundwater coming in, gushing into it. They repaired the groundwater, uh, they repaired their infrastructure and the groundwater table came up almost two to three feet. So you had a bunch of wells that were in that four, four to five range and are now in the five to seven range consistently. And I like to show this to people because this is a plot um, of the observation well that was closest to the infrastructure that was compromised. So this is an automated data logger that we have in some wells. It takes a reading every hour. 
the blue is the groundwater elevation in Boston City Base. And you can see here for the majority of, of, of time for over a year, the water table was at elevation three. It's plotted versus rainfall, which is indicated here by the magenta color. And you can see that each time it would rain, what would happen is that the groundwater table would surcharge. But then because there was a sewer that was leaking and a manhole that was leaking, that would suck the water right back down. Once the repair is made here in the fall of 2017, the water table had nowhere to go but up and it stayed up. So I mentioned the water elevations that we read every five to six weeks, they may move three, four or five inches in either direction. What we had here in this case was once the uh, sewer and the manholes were repaired and they were relined and they were rebuilt basically, the water table came up a foot and then came up another foot. This time scale here, I know is very hard to see, but this is over a period of about 48 hours. That just goes to show the impact that a sewer and, and infrastructure and manholes can have. So we had a condition where the water table was below the tops of the wood piles under the buildings. And now we have the condition where the water table is above the tops of the wood piles under the buildings and has been that and has been maintained that elevation consistently for the better part of five years. And again, um, you can see the manual readings that were taken uh, over a period of about four months. And you can see the dramatic changes that we had in the elevations from three BCB to six BCB. You're talking about a three and a half foot bump. Obviously the impact is lessened as you get further away from the source of groundwater withdrawal. But again, has a pretty significant impact um, even a couple of blocks away. And the spaghetti blot over time uh, for a series of five wells that we had, you get to see you know, the elevations of where they were and then how they all sort of met up together uh, once the infrastructure was repaired and are now all above elevation six. Um, the establishment of the city state groundwater working group and the groundwater conservation overlay district is of the utmost importance and really allowed us um, and, and, and really made people sit up and take a look and say, okay, this is important. Um, and this really gives us the teeth to do what we need to do to maintain the groundwater levels in the city. 2015, there was a groundwater day at City Hall. At the time, Mayor Menino had a press conference and he talked about bringing the agencies together and signing a memorandum of understanding to work together in what is now called the City State Groundwater Working Group. Um, where we get together every quarter with Boston Water and Sewer, MWRA, all the people that have the infrastructure, we identify the areas that are low, and then we work with them to uh, make sure that they go and investigate, and as in the previous slides I showed you, repair infrastructure that is found to be deficient. Um, we also have established the Groundwater Conservation Overlay District through the Boston Planning and Development Agency, the, B the BRA, um, the BPDA doing business as the BRA. Um, and that mitigates, again, future impacts that new projects can have. As I mentioned, the City State Groundwater Working Group includes us and all these city and state agencies, commissions, authorities. And again, um, we pledge to come together, share information, identify the areas that are depleted, and remediate, the, remediate really uh, areas that contribute to low groundwater levels. So the purpose of the, uh, the GCOD um, raise and maintain groundwater levels by the installation of groundwater recharge, eliminate leak paths, no sump pumps, no water drains under buildings, and again, get more, get more water back in the ground. The requirements are simply um, capturing, capturing one inch of, of, of water over the impervious area of the lot. You need to submit plans to Boston Water and Sewer uh, for groundwater recharge system. And then you also need to demonstrate to us in the city that the new project, uh, that the work whether you're putting in a deep basement, whether you're putting in an elevator pit, uh, new elevator or new elevator pit is not gonna have a negative impact on the water table. And that is uh, certified to us through a no harm letter. So the project engineer will stamp that letter indicating the work that we're doing here is not gonna have a negative impact because. Recharge system, as you're probably aware, nothing more than just a box in the ground, taking the roof drains instead of having them come out into the sidewalk and just spill over into the street collect them into an engineered recharge system adjacent to the building, under the building, and help recharge the groundwater table. Anything that's deep, this is actually foundation for a building. Water tight, it has, this has three levels of underground parking, no sump pumps, no under drains. As you can see here, the sheet piling around the property basically put them in their own little bathtub. The bigger buildings we don't worry about because they got to put in those sheet pilings to drive down. It's the little, the little ones that we worry about we're starting to see a lot more people putting in underground parking in row houses and digging down. 
those are the ones we need to make sure and identify that those are uh, built, uh, designed and built properly. Uh, this past summer, we actually updated the groundwater conservation overlay district. And the reason that we did that was some of the language needed to be cleaned up. And over a period of 15 years since its inception, we learned a lot more about water elevations. And more importantly, we learned a lot more about building cutoff elevations. So what we did was we updated the language to ensure that instead of the original language, which talks about capturing rainfall over the area of the building, it now captures rainfall over the impervious area of the entire lot. Make these systems bigger, get more water in the ground raise the no harm threshold that we talk about uh, for the no harm letter uh, to protect buildings with higher power cutoff elevation both from elevation seven to elevation eight. You can't have a negative impact below elevation eight and anywhere in the city now. Um, we updated the map areas to include and make everything a universal overlay area and include uh, additional neighborhoods that were not included before. And also to clean up a little bit of the uh, document submission requirements um, and make it identify, it was a little bit clear, a little bit unclear on sort of the separate requirements of the one inch capture and the no harm. We updated those. This is the new map now. The uh, older map you can see in this lighter yellow were the original areas of the GCOD. The areas with the red outline and the uh, darker yellow are the new areas of the GCOD where, again, we're protecting buildings now that are on wood piles. When the zoning was established, we didn't have any information because we were sort of getting all that together at the time. And fast forward, it made all the sense in the world to update the zoning. Um, some projects that we've worked on, we actually have a porous alley in the South End that we partnered with the city and the Charles River Watershed Association in 2014. Uh, there's a plaque on either end of the alley. And when you go, you can see an area that looks just like conventional asphalt, but in fact, it is not, uh, it is porous. And this alley is located just off of Columbus Ave in the South End between West Canton and Holyoke Street. And it's really just this 800 square foot uh, area that is porous surface. So you can see it looks very much like conventional asphalt, but it's actually porous and it allows the rainwater to infiltrate and the snow to melt um, when, it, you know, when we have precipitation. And what we've seen, again, this is a, a, a well, well that we have a lot of data, uh, data logger uh, in, information that we've seen post um, installation of the porous alley since 2014, we've seen a net gain of about a half a foot rise in the groundwater table. You can see obviously the various wild fluctuations when we get rainfall and significant rainfall, there's a whole lot of water going into the ground, but overall the averages come up over time. And what this tells us is it tells us a couple of things. Number one, they work. Uh, number two, you need to maintain them. They need to be maintained at least vacuum swept and power washed, you know, semi-annually to keep the debris out. But also it's very limited in the impact that it has. So we need much more of these, you know, as we look at the other observation walls that are adjacent to these, uh, adjacent to this porous alley, it really doesn't go that far. Um, the impact is really less as you get, you know, a, a block away really from it. So we need more of these. Um, we also need more porous infrastructure in the sidewalks. This is a porous concrete pavers along Boylston Street. So unlike conventional concrete, there are these little slots here for when it rains and the snow melts for the water to get into the ground. Um, we need more of these, again, throughout the city. Um, this is a green alley that's actually at the rear of the, at the uh, Boston Architectural College. And it's a combination of porous asphalt, pervious pavers, rain gardens, um, and again, just having these areas where the, where the, where the uh, precipitation can infiltrate into the ground. Also in East Boston um, and Central Square, there's a huge uh, green infrastructure uh, area there. And it, it, it talks about, again, um, promoting, promoting groundwater recharge. You know, for us, it's important to get the water into the ground. For the city, it's important because it removes pollution and also lessens the uh, heat island effect that you get in the summer. And there are very, uh, uh, there's a variety, excuse me, of, of different porous infrastructures just in this uh, one little square. Uh, you have pervious concrete, pervious pavement, pervious pavers. Again, all of it needs to be maintained, but to get more water in the ground, fix the stuff that leaks, that's really what we're trying to do. Um, the progress has been made. We're funded annually by the city. The city has been a wonderful partner um, and, and really a, a huge champion of ours over the years and really just letting us do our thing. And, you know, I tell people all the time, we've basically been given the keys, uh, you know, to the roles, just don't crash the roles, you know, <laughs> keep it moving, keep it driving, make sure that these buildings uh, and ultimately the water levels are preserved. We've built out the wall network. It gives us an accurate analysis. We've established the city state groundwater working group. 
we have the groundwater conservation overlay district in place. We've updated, you know, that uh, zoning again, really to just coincide with the information that we have. So what do we do? Well, I mean, we basically have to monitor in perpetuity unless we wake up one morning and all these buildings are on concrete or steel. Um, it's like owning a home. There's always something to fix, something will break. Um, and that's the importance of, of monitoring the water, water table. It's uh, the canary in the coal mine, I like to tell people, it's the warning system. We will have this spring or summer, uh, and the mayor is actually gonna be the MC of it, uh, a groundwater forum at the Boston Public Library. We're gonna have all the city and state agencies come together, all city and state elected officials in the affected areas come together, and we're gonna tell people about the progress that we made. The last time we had something like this was 2005. It's long overdue. And it's something that uh, is gonna be important, again, to tell people what we've been up to um, and the progress that's been made on this. Um, continue to promote recharge, obviously. We work with the city's environment department very closely. We're the folks at Boston Water and Sewer for any areas that we look at where we have an opportunity um, for you know, recharge projects or you know, really just pilot projects. Work with ISD, as I mentioned, on obtaining the foundation information. They have also, too, been another wonderful partner throughout this. And also the informational, excuse me, videos on our website. Um, those have been very popular and it gives people an idea of who we are, what we do, and sort of the background of all this stuff. We're also um, working on a remote monitoring solution right now where we have automated instruments in addition to our uh, data loggers, which we manually physically have to go up and upload the data. We now have instruments in, in about five wells that um, take a reading every day and can send the reading um, to uh, via the cellular network through a cloud interface. So hopefully uh, we believe we found a solution where we can get a, a contact through our iron cap. In this case, we actually used aluminum as part of a test, which the signal proved to be a little bit better um, and a little bit more reliable. So hopefully uh, as, we be, as we go through this trial period, um, you know, we'll be able to uh, expand our, our monitoring, uh, automated monitoring uh, well network. Um, we'll see it's still in its infancy, but so far the results, initial results have been, have been pretty promising. We're also in the process of taking our uh, information and putting everything into an uh, ArcGIS environment right now. You know, we have uh, all the data in an access database and the next sort of gets spit out um, into our uh, HostGator website that we have right now, which is just very basic, um, you know, those points that I showed you on the map. What we're trying to do is put it in a GIS environment and we want to basically overlay that information with the building cutoff elevation information that we have. I showed you that map of Lower Beacon Hill with the color-coded addresses. We want to have all that in one place. Right now, when somebody calls me to talk about this stuff, um, you know, you got to go to one area of the website for one thing and another area of the website for another thing. So we're in the process of doing this right now, and it looks very, very promising, and I hope it's something that we can have up and running by the spring. The home page of our website, you can subscribe to our newsletter if you want. You know, we send one of those out. We don't blast you with, with every day or every week with something. You usually hear from us about every five to six weeks on what we've been up to and what the latest and greatest groundwater levels are. Um, I do encourage people if they are interested in additional documentation or additional, uh, you know, viewing of exactly everything that I've been talking about visually, you know, really the, the first and the third video on our website, um, you know, do a pretty good job of explaining the problem, uh, why we exist, and then really the process of underprinting, as I mentioned, sort of labor intensive process and what that involves, uh, and really what goes what goes behind that. That's all I have, and I'm just going to stop sharing and open it up if there are any questions at all. Thank you, Christian. Wow, that was that was great. Of, of the many takeaways, I know the first takeaway for me was getting my head around this notion that sewer pipes and that what you're really worried about there are, are pipes that leak in rather than out. Right, <laughs> um, right. So, um, yeah, now there are lots of questions I could think of, but uh, I guess I'll just ask one right now about that. So the, the GIS and the mapping, and you showed those recent slides and also earlier with the color coding of the, uh, the depths. Uh, yeah. I wondered if, whether you've experimented with actually taking that data and creating a, uh, a graphic that maybe for public outreach and all that would be almost like a contour map of, I'd be curious to see just how, you know, if you're looking at a three dimensional, you know, rather than mountaintops and hills, it would be actually the water table sort of seen visually, you know, graphically. And then I guess you could overlay the, the other information. But have you yeah, that, that'll be, 
Yeah, that'll be the power that we'll be able to, to have with, with the GIS. Obviously, as you know, there's just so much more that we can do with that right now. The Boston Water and Sewer Commission does take our data and they do generate uh, groundwater contour maps for their internal use. And that helps them sort of target mm -hmm. the areas that they have infrastructure to go and find the leaks. You know, John Sullivan, who again has been a wonderful uh, uh, partner with us, always says, geez, you know, we really need to zero in. We have so much, so many miles of pipe and we have so many sewers and uh, creating these groundwater contours is, is essential for us because it can show us, okay, this is where it's, you know, the plea, this is where the sort of the bullseye is. It can go in and do that. But yeah, I'm really excited to get to work with storyboards in ArcGIS and, and using, you know, again, that really that engine uh, to tell a story. And I, I think it would be you know, really useful to show, uh, you know, the area of Fairfield Street that I showed you where the repair was made, um, you know, and use that and, and have the, you know, the multiple images that we have, uh, you know, and the multiple graphics that we have to show the impact of, um, you know, leaking infrastructure and repair. So, yeah, I'm actually just sort of, for years, I've created those color-coded maps and I, because we do have ArcGIS, but I've, you know, never really done more than that. I'm actually working with uh, the people that work with the city at Esri. Um, we actually just signed a contract with them to upgrade it. And as part of that, I'm in a, right now I'm in hour three of a 130 hour training session. So have a little, have a little bit of ways to go, but, um, you know, excited to, excited to get to know that, uh, you know, to get that, to get to know that program and, and really just uh, excited to work with our data and see what we can do with it. Yeah. I guess you have to have a good computer as well as the uh, software knowledge. Yeah. I upgraded both this past uh, fall. Yep needed to get some workstations so we have them we're ready to go great thanks anyone else questions comments i have a Hi. quick one hey, um, oh sorry that's where going um I'm just i'm curious uh well first thanks for the great presentation really fascinating stuff um where do you know generally where the trees came from and what kind of what kind of wood they are for all these um, pilings that are under the buildings, um, and if that changed over there over the kind of um, duration that they were being used in that. Yeah, good question. Um, from what I've read and from what engineers have told me over the years, from what from publications and, and research that they've done, is there was basically a whole forest in Maine that gave its life for the city. Um, is how how it's been described to me, and primarily the uh, type of tree was spruce um that that were that that was used so you're talking i mean if you were to take sort of a a, a cut off of the buildings you would just unleash a whole forest basically under the city which is really fascinating to think about and i actually spoke with the people uh at esri about that i said i would love to be able to have an image to show people what's under these buildings and what it looks like so that's what i've been told that's what i've read there there are a couple of books out there um boston's back bay um the story of americans uh, how, how how one of america's greatest city came to be is where i got a lot of that information uh gaining ground uh the author is nancy c shoals is another book which i'm sure some of you are familiar with that had a lot of information about um you know the making and the building of the city and the land um and there's actually another book that came out recently the atlas history of boston that was a, it's a pretty big book um i also had some fascinating information in it and I actually, in our website, um, one of the sort of the Bible for me, when I first started, um, there are uh, Boston's Back Bay. There are actually two engineers reports by um, Jim Lambrex and Dr. Hall Aldrich of Haley and Aldrich uh, engineering firm. And they wrote two, again, for me, which is sort of the Bible uh, for this whole issue and, and talks about the importance of recharging and sewers and drains and the need for an observation wall network. Um, and those are sort of the, again, the, the, the pieces of information. Those are sort of the publications that I've gotten most of my information from. Um, the author of that, Jim Lambrex, was actually the engineer that hired me for this post uh, now almost over 20 years ago. So um, he was the right person to, uh, you know, to sort of teach me all this stuff. Hmm. Speaking of the back bay, I, I, I was wondering if you're going to talk about the, the historical sort of recharge areas that were planned in there and that I, I heard about or learned about when I was following. There was, of course, that saga and that litigation and so on about the property on Hereford and right. uh, Newbury. But um, 
the, apparently the, there were actually, from the beginning, certain areas that were supposed to be not built on, parcels that were supposed to be recharge areas. I, I had never found any documentation of that. I know that was thrown yeah. around a little bit and it would make sense. It would make sense, you know, that 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 lot was sort of the last empty missing tooth along Newbury Street for years, and it was used yeah. as a parking. Um, but yeah, I, I, I never read anything about that, but I, I that was certainly that was thrown around uh, uh, quite a bit. Yeah. Um, it's, it is interesting, though, a lot of these older buildings, when they go in and they substantially rehabilitate, um, you know, and they and they start digging, they have uncovered um, dry wells. So drywalls were, uh, you know, a thing, um, and and you know maybe they they knew back then. I'm assuming they knew. Well, they the engineers definitely knew back then that the piles needed to be submerged, and um, so as a result, they probably put in these you know these recharge wells, uh, you know, in uh, these drywalls in. But never really found any official documentation of that. I'm I'm still looking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. I should I have a practical question for you on you know, actual doing doing work specifically the your role with the zoning board of appeals process yep i've got a small project in the north end within the gcot overlay um, and it's on just existing shallow rubble foundations and in order to do the renovation you know we've got to actually give it a foundation that they won't continue to settle and so uh, this process it, it, it's significant enough that it requires your review. And so I'm wondering, you know, how does that conversation start? What do we need to take with us as we go into this appeals meeting? Sure. So on our website, um, we have a, uh, a groundwater conservation overlay district tab. And that really sort of gives you the soup to nuts of the process of, okay, you've been um, cited for GCOD by inspectional services. Now, what do I do? You know, what, what are the requirements? Um, and, and again, that gives you an example of, of the, uh, the no harm letters. Um, I'm actually just going to share my screen with you right now quickly. So it gives you, it tells you what the zoning actually is. Um, you know, as I showed you this map <clears throat> and then, um, ultimately what's required and what the documents look like that are required. It sounds to me like you're in an area that um, you know, may be hard for water to get in the ground, um, even though you're in the GCOD. And we do have some areas like that. Again, this is the no harm outline, which talks about the, the responsibility of the engineer. And then the whole process of permitting and zoning and you know, sort of the timeline that all this documentation needs to be submitted. So that's all on there. Um, you know, we do work with applicants that come in and say, gee, you know, even though I'm in the GCOD, I'm kind of in an area that is original land, but the way that the line was drawn, it's sort of, you know, I'm, I'm part of it. We, we have had instances where there are variances where the proponent will certify to us and say, listen, we can't put in recharge because we're going to flood our neighbor or, you know, we're going to create a negative, a negative condition. We can't get any water on the ground. Um, and at that point, we, when we get to, before we get to the Board of Appeals, we would agree that we would support a variance. Um, but you know, we, you would really need to exhaust all efforts and have that documented. And the last really, uh, sort of line in the sand there that you would need to cross is to go to water and sewer and convince them because ultimately they're going to make you do something with the water separate from the G card, which you're probably aware of. There's a, a citywide mandate to capture an inch of water. So if you're in Jamaica plain or mission Hill and you're outside the G card, you still, if you got to go to water and sewer for something or zoning, or even water and sewer is going to make you do something with that water. Um, collect it, reuse it, whatever. So yeah, I mean, that's my information. Um, I can put my email in the chat. I'm more than happy to, to start a dialogue with that and answer any questions you have. That's, again, part of the day-to-day -day operations here and what I do. Wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate your insight. Yeah, this sure. is the kind of thing where the owner wants to do the right thing, but we're not completely sure what that is, given the circumstances and value the expertise of folks like you. Get that all the time. Yep. Certainly, um, certainly uh, more than happy to have the, have the discussion. I ran across, this is David Torrey, this MIT technology review. Uh, and it talks about groundwater rise related to sea level rise. And of course, when the sea level is going to rise, it's going to push the groundwater up with it. And it's right. not going to make back bay less of a problem, or is it going to make, of course, it's going to make problems for everybody else's groundwater if it rises. Right. Yeah. I mean, from, right. 
yeah. What do you? How do you address that question? And have you seen this? Is an article and the author is uh, Kendra Pierre Lewis. In is that most recent? recent? Yeah, I'll I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know we've we've talked about and actually see in the chat here it talks about salt and fresh water and, and making a difference. Um, you know whether or not the creatures or the insects that attack the wood if that has an impact. So we have a technical advisory committee that is comprised of all the engineers you know throughout the city is also a hydrogeologist on there that do this type of work. And we always talk about sea level rise and the impact that it could have. Um, from their point of view, it's that the salt, you know, would act more as a preservative for the wood than anything, and that would actually be a good thing. Unfortunately, it would be a problem for everything else and wreak havoc on the utilities. It would actually also be a problem for buildings that are founded on, on concrete, because um, it's a special type of concrete that you would need that when deteriorated, you probably know. Um, we actually had a case like that on the waterfront um, some years ago where the wrong type of concrete was used and it actually decayed because it became in, in, in touch with salt water. Um, the feeling is that in the majority of the areas, except for you know East Boston and along the North End and the Central Waterfront, the Four Point Channel, the barriers of the, of, of the Charles River Dam and really the Central Artery sort of would protect the uh, those areas from from inundation. You know, it, it would be more it wouldn't be a case of of groundwater being pushed in because those barriers are in place, it would be more of uh, the water coming over the top in the worst case scenario, you know, and then in that case, you know, we're all in trouble, um, unfortunately. So hopefully, you know, I tell people all the time that the environment department is doing wonderful work and hopefully we're at a point now where we can start talking about this and, you know, coming up with real solutions. We've been, I feel like for the past 15, 20 years, we've just been talking about this stuff and now we're actually finally starting to get you know, the real solutions and, and, you know, what we can really do um, to mitigate the impact. But yeah, from the, from the technical advisory committee's point of view, um, you know, most of the, the areas that we're, we're, we're uh, concerned with, you know, wouldn't be impacted necessarily right away. Now, if you're talking about, you know, the estimations are anywhere from one to three feet of sea level rise by 2070 or 2100, certainly if you're on the higher end of that, and that higher end of projection, you know, comes to fruition, uh, you know, that's, that's being a lot of, a lot of trouble. Um, so, but yeah, that's interesting. Uh, thank you for, for sending that. I'm, I'm going to look at that. Thanks. Thank you. Very interesting. Christian, I just had a quick question about your um, domain or your jurisdiction, so to speak. Um, if I was reading the maps correctly, um, you're not in Charleston or you're, you're not, we're not assessing water in Charleston. Did I read that correctly? Or Correct. Yeah, so the information that we've compiled over the years, um, you know, even though there is filled land in Charlestown, we haven't had evidence. It's been anecdotally, I've heard of some of the older buildings, some of the old wharf buildings or, or uh, buildings along the waterfront having wood piles. But um, again, you know, we really rely on the technical advisory committee engineers to advise us on what areas they think will be impacted and haven't had um, you know, any, any really indication that there's sort of a large swath of buildings that have been impacted. Um, that was actually brought up in the, in this past summer about expanding the overlay district and whether or not it should be, uh, should include Charlestown. Um, we haven't seen any evidences of yet, but, you know, this is, again, this whole thing is one big working document. And as we get information, and that was really the genesis of the changes this past summer, um, we update the zoning as appropriate where it needs to be. And if at some point it does need to be expanded to other areas of the city, we'll do that. Um, the BPDA was very excited when we approached them and said, look, we wanna, we wanna revise this. Um, for them, it was, it's, it was really a simple thing. And for them, it's worked so well. Um, anytime we have any request or any, anything that needs to be done, um, they're right there for us. Great, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Hey, Christian, I had a question. I think you mentioned around 1931 was perhaps about a rule of thumb of where you started to see some steel and concrete piles. And I'm curious on your, if anything, anecdotal kind of conclusions on how have those been faring over time, just maybe because of the inherent challenges that come along with those sets of conditions and materials. Yeah, I mean, they've, you know, um, anecdotally, so I know of two buildings that actually had some test pits done for, uh, uh, that were constructed, I think it was 1925, um, that were constructed on concrete, and they recently took a look at the concrete, and the concrete was in good shape. Um, 
so those buildings are okay. But other than that, I haven't, you know, heard anything. But that's an interesting question because that does get brought up a lot. Um, you know, we talk about other foundation types and sort of what the shelf life of those are. Um, so that's something that, that we're cognizant of and something that we're certainly going to be aware of, you know, um, need to be aware of moving forward. It's not just wood, um, despite the fact we always talk about wood and wood is primarily the, you know, the, the biggest, uh, you know, number of buildings to support, not wood, but a oh, good question. Yeah. Thanks. Other thoughts? I just, uh, Todd, are you raising your hand? You're muted though. Todd did what I did this morning, just started talking. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm on, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, I was wondering, Christian, if you saw that article uh, in March, 2020 in the Wall Street Journal about how uh, some of Boston's most expensive real estate is being affected by uh, rottings of pilings due to the lowering of groundwater. And if you can tell us how, how much improvement in that area, if any, has been made since that article came out. Yeah, so I was actually uh, interviewed pretty extensively for that article. Um, mm -hmm. I will say I was sort of disappointed in the tone and the way that it, it came on and told the story at the very end of it. Um, you know, I want to emphasize to people and I, I wanted the article to emphasize that, yeah, we've made great strides and we continue to make great strides, but ultimately we're not going to save every building. And the reason that we're not going to save every building is there is that huge gap of data between the 1930s and then really the early 2000s in water levels. So we had no idea what the water table was doing at that time. So Thankfully, you didn't have as much development anywhere near the, the amount of development that you have now. Um, and thankfully, the GCOT is in place for that, um, that you did back then. But there was some. So, you know, that article talked about some, built, some people having to underpin their buildings and having to repair their buildings, even though the groundwater trust existed and these provisions were in place. And the reason for that was, was that when you looked at some of those buildings that were repaired, the engineers came in and they dug test pits. And they found the water table high above the tops of the original pilings, but the problem was that the piling had already rotted. So there was a period of time between when the building was constructed and when we started monitoring levels where the groundwater level, for whatever reason, was depressed. And then it came back up. So there are those, unfortunately, there are those outlier buildings that were impacted and that were affected, um, some in the north end, where the buildings needed to be repaired, but there was no groundwater trust at the time. Um, so you had no idea what the water elevation was, and there was no groundwater conservation overlay district at the time to mitigate a negative potential impact. So, um, you know, since that article, the article is, is, is you know, uh, almost two years old now. Um, and we had this little thing in the middle of that, that right after the article ran uh, called the pandemic, which just sort of sent everything into a tailspin. So as uh, not just for us, but for everybody else. Um, so I, we've made progress in, uh, in regards to updating the GCOD zoning to answer your question. Now that I get back to it, the original question, we've made updates in identifying the sources of, of drawdowns. And Jack, you had actually mentioned uh, right before this um, that uh, I think it was the drone nut uh, device. And it talked yeah. about, you know, yes. you spec. and, you know, we're actually, we're working with water and sewer right now on a pilot program where, you know, we would assist in funding for something like that to look, an additional uh, look in the look in the sewers, you know, to be able to go in these sewers and take a look and use that. And like you said, the propellers wouldn't be in the way to get, you know, in the way of, of you know, uh, going through and just basically just flying through a tunnel, um, a, a pipe, excuse me. So yeah, Todd, to answer your question, um, again, we've definitely made progress in the zoning and in the uh, certainly identifying the leaks, but that's sort of the, you know, the tough thing for us. Um, we don't know the cutoff elevations of all these buildings and we don't know what the water table did for, you know, 70 years, 60 years in, in between that, um, which unfortunately put some buildings at, at, at risk. Thank, thanks in the, in the chat to Susan Schur for posting that, citing uh, the, uh, summer 1979 issue of her Technology and Conservation Magazine, an article by Aldrich. So uh, yeah. Susan, I bet I have a, 
I bet I have a paper copy. <laughs> if the silverfish haven't gotten to it yet, that 1979 <laughs> magazine. And so thank you so much, Christian. This is really uh, so informative and helpful and, and certainly to the <laughs> uh, uh, current. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And, um, you know, certainly I put my email in the chat if anybody wants to follow up, feel free to email me. Um, also, keep in mind if there are any other organizations or groups that you think would be uh, that would benefit from this, more than happy to, you know, to do this. Um, this is this is part of part of my job and part of what I do, and I, uh, you know, definitely enjoy it. So. Yeah, well, I'm sure I would certainly think that other other BSA committees it's certainly relevant, but but it also mesh well, I think, with our our big picture interest in historic resources and historic structures and neighborhoods and so on. So. Thank you again. Uh, hey. I, know it's getting, I know it's getting a little late, but uh, the, the agenda had some announcements for uh, uh, well, the Architectural Plastics Conference Proceedings Plus. So it's a, a appended to the back. Uh, if people are, want to buy the two volume publication still available for uh, uh, a, a complete information resource. Uh, NASA Historical announced the round 28 of the MPPF, the, the matching grant program. Um, so uh, you can go online for, for those uh, for nonprofits, municipalities, and so on to apply. Uh, coming up next month, the APT Northeast chapter, the uh, annual meeting and symposium is going to be live in Hudson, New York, at Hudson Hall and virtual on February 25th. The theme of uh, walking the preservation tightrope which I think of uh, as maybe a tug of war as well as a tightrope of technology, latest technology versus tradition, traditional crafts, uh, you name it. So uh, that's, uh, that promises to be great. And then I also just for because uh, drawings I think are still, still important, uh, especially you know, manual drawings and drafting and the annual uh, Holland Prize. So uh, the, it goes to the Historic American Building Standard and follows the Historic American Buildings Survey and follows their, their drawing standards. So most of the winner. So uh, next month, uh, we are slated to, to have uh, uh, two uh, Afghan architect planners, happen to be uh, husband and wife, to talk about Bamiyan Valley and that whole sort of up and down and tragedy and, and uh, such as it is, stops and starts for conservation management there at that World Heritage Site and, and others in Afghanistan. So I hope you can join us then. So uh, any other announcements? Um, hearing none, thanks again to everyone. And so uh, hope to see you next month. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye all. Bye, Thank thanks you. everyone. <laughs>